today we would like to dis discuss more about renewable energy from the perspective of someone whose core business is renewable energy. Um, before we st start and dig into the, the topic, can you tell us more about you and your role in Enertrack? So, as you said, uh, my name is Javier Arroyo. I'm working for Enertrack for now almost uh, five, and, five years and some months. I am head of project valuation and new markets. And my main role uh, is to, to coordinate, let's say, the financial valuation and financial structuring of all projects. And um, among other activities, and that's what uh, brought us together in this case with, uh, with you, is that we are responsible for preparing for the, for the auctions of renewable energy systems in the markets where we operate. And in case of not uh, participating in a public auction, but rather structuring a PPA, then my uh, group and my department is also responsible for the, for the preparation, negotiation of these PPAs that help to implement, uh, to implement renewable uh, energy projects. Do you operate in many markets? Yes, we do. Um, Enatrag is originally is a German company. It was founded in 1998. So the main and core market is, uh, was and is still Germany. So France is our second uh, biggest market where we're active. And in 2007, I think we started developing our first uh, projects in Poland. So that's why it's uh, more or less since 15 uh, for 15 years that we're active there. And um, in 2017, we entered in South Africa where we have a big, uh, a big uh, team of around 35 to 40 people and we have a, a big development pipeline. And let's say newer markets where we are active at the moment are um, Vietnam, uh, Spain, Uruguay and Ghana, I would say. And we have in all of the countries I named, we have a, a pipeline of projects in, let's say, a pretty early stage. These are quite exotic markets, and at least some of, some of them. Uh, can you tell us more how you compare the maturity of the Polish market versus the, 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 the Western market? Is renewable energy, in your perception, as important for uh, you know, uh, Polish shareholders as it is for for your West, for our Western Euro Europe colleagues. I I think so, especially uh, if we I mean when we compare um, energy markets in in different countries, we always have a look at what is the actual energy mix of the of the country, and therefore with a huge amount of huge percentage of uh, coal within the Polish energy mix. I think that the renewable uh, energy is an uh, extremely important tool to decarbonize, decarbonize the country and to help, let's say, uh, companies to get greener. Uh, the, the Polish uh, market is getting every time more, more and more interesting and there's more dynamic on it. But of course, we suffered uh, a lot the past of, uh, yeah, I would say, eight to ten years that we experienced before 2018. And, um, and therefore, I, I have to be especially thankful to our country manager uh, in, in, from, for Enertrag in Poland that was always believing while other voices were telling, is really Poland a, a market where we want to be? And um, we had a long uh, breath, I, I think, and we stayed there. And therefore, now this is just paying off. Do you find it easy to deal with Polish companies when you when you negotiate or discuss with them commercial aspects of renewable energy? I figure that there are two distinctive populations, ones for which energy is core business, like your natural retailers and off-takers or O&M providers, but there's a second population, companies such as, for example, Orange Polska, with whom you signed the corporate PPA, is the second population in, in, in particular easy to deal with in your, in your view? I think in general dealing with Polish uh, companies and, Col and Polish counterparties is uh, easy uh, because of course there are always uh, cultural uh, differences and so on but uh, we are two countries, Germany and, and Poland, that are very close so I think that the way of understanding each other is, is uh, very good and I think that Polish uh, people and po Polish companies are 
communicate in a very uh, direct and transparent way. And now to the second part of the, of the second population that you mentioned of off-takers. Of course, there is a little bit of, um, of effort to be done in order to speak the same language. Uh, not, not in terms of language, in terms of English, but in energy and, and terminology language. Because we are uh, talking with off-takers that are not... A, a familiar with renewables, a familiar with having a fluctuant uh, uh, energy production facility, but rather have a, a, a base load and, 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 a, and a profile, a, a consumption profile that is constant and that is, let's say, only dependent on their needs. And there is a big effort to make there in order to uh, make, uh, to get a common ground and make them understand that renewable energies that are fluctuating energies where we need to uh, plan with some volatility, with some unbalancing and so on, imbalancing and so on. Simple example is I need electricity on always the same electricity one day at the same hours. And if one of taker is just using uh, renewables, this is simply not possible because if in these hours there is not a lot of wind and there is uh, at night, then there's no possibility to, to work with renewables and uh, with wind and, and solar. So it took a little, and, and it will still take a little bit to uh, get these two uh, parties to interact with, good with each other. But I'm sure after the, uh, yeah, the, the successful transaction that we did with Orange in this case, that we uh, set a very important and big milestone for that, and that the conversations and the understanding, understanding to each other will continue improving, definitely. I see similar situation. I, will, I, I call it usually that there is some kind of gap that, that we need to bridge. Do you think there is anything like some kind of easy fix that those off-takers could do in order to, to bridge the gap a little bit between the generators and, and, you know, and, and their needs and their understanding of the market that, that they could un undertake? Um... Yes, I mean, I, and, and of course, this is a, a long and, and very interesting, but long topic on what there would be needed to be done there. But I think to come a little bit away on securing hourly and daily volumes and amounts of energy and rather dealing with uh, the possibility to secure annual amounts of energies where renewables are in, a, let's say, in a long term Mm, annual and so on very or pretty uh, uh, have a pretty stable production where we work with uh, statistical figures so if we uh, start to, to talk about longer intervals of settlements and longer intervals of which about which energy energy volumes we're talking about and that we face and identify which kind of risks renewable energy have to put some example profile risk, to put some example, volume risk, balancing risks, and so on. And that all parties, off-taker and producer, identify these risks, acknowledge it, and then say, okay, who takes the risk and how is it priced in? So paraphrasing this a little bit, do you mean that understanding the consequences about the, the variability and intermittence of the renewables and the consequences is, is the key? This is the key and, and, and to make them understand and also, uh, and, and this would be something that interests me a lot also, making them know or, or knowing if they can, let's say, structure their consumption in a way that is more uh, responsive to, uh, to uh, renewable energy capacities and that is a little bit flexible. If there is more renewable resource uh, available, we produce more or, or something. I'm not 100% sure how, uh, how this can be done, but this would be also interested to understand from their side if they can, let's say, couple somehow this uh, flexibility on their per, on the on the consumption side to the production side is yes. let's talk about the process of, of the the ppa we had pleasure or to or cooperate or be against each other however you, you call it uh, <laughs> let's let's call it cooperation then. Uh, so we were in negotiations for pretty long time and can you share you know 
was this process complex and difficult for you or, or it was, you know, or, or it was rather smooth in your view. Can you share us, you know, how you perceive it? You perceive it? I would say it was a smooth process with up and downs, of course. Um, but I think that both parties, or the three parties in this case, with with UPWC also um, advising uh, there, um, was very transparent and and very straightforward, and we always. Um, placed and, and openly discussed what the main issues of each party was and um, all, the other party was always trying to accommodate these issues in order to and, and respecting their uh, red flags and their must-haves and so on but I think that it was rather a, a smooth process and however of course it was a, there was an, a request for, for uh, proposals from, from the side and we were searching for this concrete project um, a possibility to implement the project via a PPA because unfortunately in, in Poland the uh, renewable energy uh, regulation is that if there has been a, um, a participation of some uh, renewable projects in a grid connection point already in a public auction then afterwards you cannot participate again through the same uh, grid connection point with another project um, and that was our case. So we, uh, in this grid connection po point, we already had one pro uh, project that uh, were awarded with a public auction. So we needed to uh, to um, search for a private solution and a private PPA in order to uh, be able to implement this project that came afterwards. And uh, that the timing was perfect because this was the time when when Orange uh, released the, the request for, for proposals. And after, yeah, I think some two, three weeks of um, some discussions and that we delivered our offer there. Uh, we were discussing and we were selected in the, in, the, uh, in the shortlist. And after that, I think everything got from, let's say, very generic at the beginning to very concrete and project specific at the end. Javier, are you satisfied with the outcome? I am satisfied with the outcome, yes. Um, of course, the uh, the, pri the market prices have ev uh, ev evolved in a way that we are still in a very, very uh, high market price scenario. So that probably we would rene renegotiate the project uh, now, the terms would be different. Well, usually my, my, my feedback to, to this kind of situation, because such situations always occur either from one side or the other side. I always recommend everyone to assess the situation at the date the decision was made. And, you know, it could have been completely different outcome on, on both ends. And so, 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 you know, I don't think anyone should be in pain on, on that. We don't have a crystal ball. And that's often my clients when they ask about the corporate PPA ask, what, but what if the prices fall? Well, yeah. That's 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 the yeah. case, and that's the, that, that's the outcome. And I, I understand that this, from Enertrack perspective, I understand this was your first financial virtual P P PPA in, in the group. Uh, was it easy for you to deal with this me mechanism, and was it fairly acceptable within the, the organization? Yes. Um, however, we also had a a learning process on that. Um, we had signed PPAs, but for uh, short terms PPAs, especially in Germany for facilities that uh, went uh, or that finished the secure tariff and that were 15 or 20, 20 years old and they needed to fix a PPA for two or three years. We have already done this, but to structure a PPA, a financial PPA for implementing a project since the beginning, it was the, the first time that we did. And of course, we needed to have some workshops internally to uh, represent and explain how the terms of this agreement were. Let's talk about corporate PPAs versus a, a normal PPA. Because while you're venturing on the corporate P PPA journey, you're just replacing it, for example, f with a contract from a retailer. Is corporate PPA somehow more important and relevant and it's a better opportunity for you? What drives you to select corporate PPA instead of dealing simply with a normal off-taker on the market? Yes. I would like to, uh, to, to put, a, I mean, we can compare PPAs and, and physical PPAs and corporate PPAs, but my message is clear there that we still need for renewable energy in all countries public auction systems that allow to the, the project implementation to be quicker and, 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 and cheaper also. That being said, 
and this is the, an important message that we need uh, public auctions. We um, we think that uh, corporate PPAs is a, a, a very good solution instead of directly uh, phys physical PPAs because it allows much more flexibility and also because it allows companies that uh, consume a lot of uh, electricity but that doesn't that this doesn't mean that they are energy experts to get closer to the uh, to the electricity market and to the energy uh, system uh, and, and to understand what is important in the delivery of electricity. Do you think renewables will grow, grow in importance over time? I completely think that renewables will grow massively and of course not alone because renewables stand alone will have a limit in terms of System, uh, system dimensioning and system flexibility because of course you don't want to produce your uh, uh, your paper or your sugar only if your if the wind blows or if the sun shines but you want to produce it in any case and therefore we need system flexibility we need energy storages and we need sector coupling and that's why rene yes renewables will grow up a lot but it needs to grow with sector coupling technologies like we're uh, developing now with green hydrogen, especially with green hydrogen and its related products, green ammonia, uh, e-methanol, power to liquid kerosene, etc., a sustainable avi aviation fuel, and also with energy storages like batteries, etc. What's next for Enertrack? What will be your business focus in, in time to come? Yeah, it's a, it's a good transition to what I just said because I let's say the last 30, 20, 10 years, we were installing renewable energies and gaining the experience with these renewable energies that allowed the technology to get matured, to get cost efficient, to learn from the mistakes of the technology in the, in the last years. And I think that we are in a point where I, I, I don't like to say wind and PV is plain vanilla business because it's not, but where the technology is already mature enough to be combined with others and to put the, the, the second step on this energy transition in order to allow, uh, allow flexibility to the system. And this flexibility is done with, in our view, mainly with green hydrogen and green hydrogen products. And that's where we are um, yeah, basing our, let's say, vision and, and mission within the next three, five years where we already have a very a very big uh, uh, pipeline of green uh, of green hydrogen pro uh, projects in different markets and where we think that these of course always combined with renewables will be the key in order to have a decarbonized system and a decarbonized world that this or oh, every party need to work for that and off takers also for sure Javier, important topic for me is what convinces like big corporate of takers to, to go into renewable energy. What What's your arguments and how you convince them to, to start the venture with you? I like and, and want to think that the, what convinces them is their strong belief is in the, the uh, an electricity system and an energy system needs to be decarbonized and that we need to uh, keep our planet as clean as possible. And this is only be possible with uh, green electricity. So I uh, want to think that this is the that this is the the reason for that, and of course um, uh, their their strategy vision on that and that they want to be uh, or net zero or reduce their emissions of CO two with some let's say short term uh, uh, horizons, and of course oh, another reason is the financial instruments in terms of. Uh, guarantees of origin uh, advantages or also in the other way possible penalties that they would need to pay in in case that they are not green or renewable until a, a, a date x and who's the typical corporate of taker you deal with is this a company that has esg priorities or is this simply large consumer of electricity it depends it depends and i would say it depends on the market it depends on the country um for example, in Poland, uh, it is what we saw. It's, it's uh, a lot or several different telecommunication companies. That's interesting that the branch is or, or the, the, 
the sector that uh, we got approached with uh, was the telecommunication one. Of course, some um, some uh, production of, of cement and very strong um, electricity consumers. But for example, in South Africa, there are a lot of uh, a lot of mines of uh, natural resources like titanium, like aluminium, and so on that are mining with convention with with of course with electricity that is con uh, conventional electricity and that they are running a lot of requests for proposals now for get the electricity for the mining purposes of these uh, of these uh, resources uh, go greener so it is very country specific my guest today was javier arroyo garcia thank you javier for for, for coming into to the interview and de dedicating your time my pleasure. Uh, I'm sure we'll still see each other again on the on the market, on the other side of the table, perhaps. So thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you, Jan. And it was a pleasure for me. Thank you. <laughs>